On Over a Coffee today, I'm talking to Alex Rogers, Executive Vice President of Qualcomm and President of Qualcomm Technology Licensing. We're talking about the automotive technological revolution that's coming with 5G. What does it mean for consumers? What does it mean for Europe and the strategic autonomy? And what does it mean for the automotive industry? Alex Rogers, thanks for joining us today over a coffee. I wish we could do this sitting in California somewhere, but uh, that'll have to wait for a little bit. Look, today I wanted to talk about the future of 5G and automotive and what it really means to have uh, automotive digital transformation. What does that mean to you and to Qualcomm? Well, first of all, Brian, thanks for having me. It's great to see you again. So let's talk about uh, automotive and digital transformation. On the one hand, people are familiar with electric, electrification. I mean, we've got EVs coming, everybody's familiar with EV, and essentially the automobile is transforming into a computer on wheels. Um, but there's another transformation that's coming and it's enabled by connectivity. And so when you think about 5G and everything is connected to everything, the automobile is connected to um, other cars, infrastructure, pedestrians, bicyclists, there's going to be a transformation in the way people drive. Uh, it's going to enable more than is enabled now, even with the most advanced safety features. So you'll have more efficiency and definitely more safety and even um, significant cutbacks, even with, with, with internal combustion engines, you'll have significant cutbacks on CO2. And so let me just give you an example. Right now, um, with an advanced car, you'll have safety features um, cameras, LIDAR, radar, that are essentially an extension of human beings and how we operate a vehicle. You can see a certain direction, uh, you can hear things, and you operate the vehicle in response to those inputs. That's how cars act now with most advanced technology. But in the future, it'll be different. So in the future, when you have connected vehicles, a car entering an intersection at a high rate of speed will understand that there's another car behind a building that can't be seen on cameras or with the human eye, and it's coming at the same intersection, and they'll be in communication, and the accident will be avoided because of radio communication, because of CV to X. There'll be synchronized driving on highways, tremendous efficiency. There'll be ultra precise uh, positioning. Cars will know where they are on the roadway within centimeters. And so there'll be a complete transformation in the automotive space in terms of how we experience um, the car. And that's completely aside from the massive uh, throughput and the massive experiences by way of uh, digital information that, that, yeah, that drivers will have. You talk about a computer on wheels, and I think it's, you know, you expect the car to be producing something like eight gigabytes of data, which is about, what, 20 mobile phones in Western Europe at the moment as well. You know, that's not a, a, an easy thing to, for us to produce at the moment. So do you expect a smooth rollout with these new capabilities? Well, first of all, um, the automotive space will be a power user of wireless data. Um, and the rollout uh, is actually happening faster than you think. I mean, there are, there are efforts in Europe. We've got two billion um, that's, that's being advanced towards infrastructure for 5G. Um, you've got corridors that, be, that are being set up to test these capabilities. So there will be a transition. It'll take time. Um, you'll see the EV coming along a little bit faster than you see this happening. Um, but eventually, the experience of the user and the experience of the car OEM is going to change. Um, this massive amount of data will enable OEMs to have relationships with their customers that don't exist at this point in time the massive amount of data that will be used to ex essentially make the automotive uh, transportation experience more efficient will completely change. Um, your ability to, to do anything you want in a car similar to what you have in a smartphone is going to change. And one of the things that's, that's telling, when you look at the future, um, you look at a company like Xiaomi, it's a handset company in China. It's one of the, the top three handset companies in the world right now. They're getting into the EV space. Why? because it's going to merge with their expertise. They have connections with customers and they're gonna continue that connection from handset to automotive. It's going to completely change the way in which automotive does business. 
that brings with it other challenges. A big issue here in Europe at the moment politically is strategic autonomy, and it's not just for the technology sector as well. But when we talk about technological sovereignty as well as strategic sovereignty, you know, what does this mean for uh, in terms of 5G? What does this mean for Europe and the automotive sector in terms of 5G as well? Tech sovereignty is at the forefront of, of uh, discussion. And so when you look at um, technologies that really matter, people are very focused on semiconductors right now because of the shortage, everybody's feeling it. And so uh, competence in semiconductors is something that is an intense focus right now. Another area of competence is in mobile, in cellular communications. Uh, that infrastructure, that technology uh, enables a level of competence that is extraordinarily valuable. 5G will, will enable well over 200 billion in you know, additional GDP in Europe. 20 million jobs will be created uh, you know, within the next five or six years. And so this is an area uh, that should also have the same level of focus as the semiconductor area. In Europe, the competence already exists. You have Ericsson, you have Nokia, you have the ability not only to deploy, you have the ability to actually create the underlying technology that then leads into standards and then leads into deployment. So the, the, the innovation um, competence is already there. And so with the notion of tech sovereignty, there may be in Europe areas where you need to build competence in order to have that sovereignty. But mobile is an area where you already have the competence. The key there is to keep it. The key okay. is to, to ensure that it isn't damaged. If, if Europe is going to keep this competence, does that give it a global competitive advantage? Does it make Europe a powerhouse when it comes to 5G? And you know, for the next generation after 5G as well, is, do you think Europe is well positioned uh, to be able to advance quickly? Or uh, you know, are we going to suffer like we did with 3G uh, as well, far behind the curve? Uh, Europe actually is, is well positioned. Put aside the handset space. What's happening in mobile now is that mobile is advancing into every industry. And so there's a new field of opportunity. Um, even if the handset space is mature, there's a new field of opportunity in every other vertical that exists, including in manufacturing where Europe has strengths, including in automotive where Europe has strengths. Um, you know, you get into smart cities, you get into smart factories. Um, Europe has strengths in all of these areas. The key is that you want to maintain your competence in the underlying innovation that's actually going to drive transformation in all of these areas. You want to be able to participate in the development of the roadmap from 5G to 6G. The continuing development in 5G in, in and of itself is enormous. And so you want to maintain this competence and then you want to deploy that competence in all of these other areas where Europe absolutely does have strength. Uh, there's no question about it. It's not all dependent on you know, who's making uh, mobile handsets. This is so far beyond mobile handsets now. Um, the, 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 the promise of 5G is, the, is, is in extraordinary because it's not simply limited to handsets. Okay, a part of that strength has got to come with intellectual property ownership as well. And if you talk about global standards in terms of previous technological shifts as well, you know, how do we apply this in the, the cellular industry today? Is, is, do you see a change in terms of how global standardization is working? And you know, what role does China play in this? I, I spoke with somebody from Etsy, the Stand Global Standards Organization, a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying China are extremely um, cooperative and active when it comes to, to standards as well. How do you see Europe uh, in terms of uh, standards and this process? So with mobile, Europe has actually been the um, kind of the the, the rule of law center for the development of mobile worldwide. And so uh, Etsy has essentially served as the umbrella organization to enable the development of standards and the IP policies associated uh, with patents relating to those standards um, throughout the world. And that has been extraordinarily valuable. Um, you look how mobile has, um, has advanced in ways uh, you know, far beyond what anybody imagined when we first had 2G and, and we're moving into 3G. And it, a big part of that is because of the, the organization around global and open standards um, and IP policies within uh, mobile that make sense, um, you know, governed by Etsy. And we can't take that for granted. 
we have to actually continue to you know, drive that policy that standards need to remain open, that standards need to remain global. China has benefited enormously. Everybody has benefited enormously. Everybody around the world has benefited enormously. And we have to uh, resist temptations to try to nationalize standards. Um, and those are out there. There are, there are different countries around the world that are advocating for nationalized versions of cellular standards, which would actually start to balkanize standards and make um, essentially the worldwide market more difficult to participate in. That has to be resisted. We have to keep reminding ourselves that open global standards are very important. Well, what does that mean if, if we balkanize the standards? What does that mean for a, a car manufacturer? You, do, does it give, if, for example, BMW, Audi, are they disadvantaged in the European market, the American market, compared to a, a large a standardized market in China, for example? Or, are we holding back our, our champions? So if you have balkanized standards that have different technological requirements in different markets, you're going to wind up having more complicated SKUs. And you don't want that. You want to be able to produce, whether it's a mobile phone or a car, you want to be able to produce a single SKU that will operate in, in all jurisdictions. You don't want to have to go through a number of different SKUs. You don't want to have to go through interoperability testing. Uh, you know, and folks on the supply chain would have to do this interoperability testing that's different in all of these different uh, countries because they've added different technological requirements um, that will disadvantage, uh, you know, a manufacturer from outside of that that market. Um, and that can happen. Uh, that that choice can be made. It's just not a good choice. And it's not a good choice for manufacturers in Europe that are making cars that they want to deploy worldwide. It just creates cost uh, and it creates an efficiency. Okay, I want to ask you about the SEPs as well and in terms of licensing for the automotive industry in Europe. How do you feel about this? What's your take on, on SEPs at the moment? So standard essential patents have for now nearly two decades been the subject of controversy. And uh, frankly, it's a bit of a tempest in the teapot. It's a very serious issue but a bit of a tempest in the teapot. Just take a look at mobile and what it has meant by way of um, um, revenue. Uh, in 2019, mobile was about $4.1 trillion. Um, royalties associated with standard essential patents in 2019 were somewhere in the 10 to $13 billion range. You're talking about royalty rates for the entire SEP licensing market um, of less than 1%, 0 point something percent. It's a bit of a tempest in the teapot. But SEPs and the licensing of SEPs are critical to driving ongoing innovation that's now, as I said before, not only going to benefit the future of the handset space, but the future of the automotive space and the future of every other space that's going to adopt 5G. And it happens that in Europe, you have two companies that are very uh, confident in this area, um, Ericsson and Nokia. And in order for them to continue to innovate in fundamental cellular technology that will now benefit you know, every vertical, um, they have a licensing business and they have to get a reasonable return on that licensing business in order to drive that innovation. So all of the battles that were fought in the mobile litigation wars were all designed to compress that return, to, to essentially make it de minimis um, and to make it frankly not worthwhile to continue to innovate for the industry in general. That's bad policy. Those battles have essentially been won. A lot of arguments have been put to bed. We shouldn't carry that over as 5G extends into automotive, automotive into other verticals. We should put an end to that and actually just, let's just drive some solutions for licensing of SEPs in these different spaces that then allows us to roll this technology out to automotive, into IoT, into everything else that uh, is gonna adopt 5G. And let's keep our eye on the ball. The value of this innovation is enormous. It's trillions of dollars of benefit. Okay, just we're running close on time. So I just want to ask you about, uh, I read Qualcomm is working uh, on a collaborative uh, research project with, uh, I think it's uh, Eurocom, uh, France Breve and IMT as well. Why is this important for Qualcomm to participate with research partners like this? So we really appreciate the opportunity to work with France Breve, IMT, and Eurocom. And it's important to us because as, a, as a, essentially a research organization um, that is engaged in technology development tech transfer, 
we look for partners who understand that and appreciate that. And I think it's very important for any innovation economy to have a deep appreciation of that. And France Breve is essentially a partner who is focused on enabling other um, organizations to conduct fundamental research to obtain important intellectual property and to drive it into practical uses, in this case, into standards. And so France Breve is providing essentially the IP help and the standardization help in conjunction with IMT and Eurocom. And Qualcomm is providing the funding. So this is an important partnership that, that keeps a focus on the foundation of everything that's going to happen with respect to 5G and cellular, which is important to us. And obviously, we've been in, in Europe for a long, long time, uh, 30 years. We've been in 11 different countries, 29 offices. We care about innovation in Europe. It's very important to us to have good partnerships at a level of deep innovation. Alex Rogers, thanks so much for joining us over a coffee today. Great, thanks for having me.